So conversion stories and testimonies can be so encouraging to people, can they not? When we, when we hear about how people have come to, to saving faith, it's just so encouraging. You know, especially if we hear somebody that has been walking in one way with, with not with the Lord, and then all of a sudden they come to saving faith, and we hear their testimony. We, we might sit back and say, that's some weighty stuff. Man, and we just get encouraged by seeing God transferring somebody from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. We might say things like, wow, the Lord's really going to use that person. And we can, as time goes on, we start to see that as they're walking with the Lord, how their, their testimony not only becomes just a, 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 a voice or something that they say, but they live out major changes in their lives to the point where when they say things, you, you really truly agree. Or they help to clarify things. Or they will have what I call a street credit. Their testimony carries a lot of weight. But then, on the other end of the spectrum, we hear of people that have been raised in the church. And when, when we'll hear testimonies of that, and we've been raised in the church our whole lives, we, we can't even remember the first time we went to church, or the first time that we heard the gospel. Always we know that we've been in church our whole lives, and we, we love Jesus, and we have a devotion for Jesus, but we really don't remember those conversion stories. We don't have a definitive point of saying, this is what, what, what has happened to me. And sometimes we might say something down the lines of, man, I almost wish I walked a life of ungodliness so I could have that happen in my life because it's just so powerful. And as a result of that, we don't really pay attention to our own testimony. But see, if that is you, if everybody in here has had one of those two conversion stories, unless you have not been converted but even those who have been raised in the church that you might not be able to think about your point of conversion. That's a huge testimony. And your testimony has serious weight behind it. When you speak and you speak truth into the lives of others, man, your testimony can have some real weight. But regardless of what your testimony has been, Sometimes we look at other people and we'll say, man, if I would have had that kind of a life, I'd be zealous for the Lord now. Sometimes we look at people and say, they're definitely going to have some, some spiritual treasure. And we'll think back to ourselves and we'll say things like, how can I gain spiritual treasure when I'm, when I'm just swimming in so many physical burdens to where a testimony doesn't give us encouragement because of our burdens. And this is something that our passage today in Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 8 is going to speak into. So if you look at Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 8 with me, we will start to read. I'm going to read the totality, well, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 to give you the context. Hear now the word of the living and true God. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is of no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God in glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ 
the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. As far as the reading of the word of God, amen. So the burden of this passage is also the burden of all Christians. That is, this passage seeks to answer the question, how can I be sure that the surpassing knowledge, the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ Jesus as my Lord is my spiritual treasure compared to Jesus being my means to spiritual treasure? That's really the the burden of this text. So as we look at our lives and we think about how can I gain spiritual treasure when I'm swimming in physical burdens, it happens when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ. And you will find then if he is your actual treasure or if he is a means to your treasure. And that's how we do that. That's how we recognize this. We, so, as you strive to see this, the supremacy of Christ, you can do this by considering your, your, your comparative motives, and, and you'll see what you value most. Look with me at verses 4 and 7. Paul says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Let me remind you of the context here, because Paul is not just having a motive to boast in his flesh. I mean, he says just uh, of the verse back that, that he glories in Christ Jesus. And we talked about last week that glorying in Christ Jesus is to boast in Christ Jesus. So Paul's motive here is not to boast in his own flesh, even though he says that, that some have confidence in, confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul, if you remember from last week, Paul laid the, the, the essential theological foundation. He, the, the experience of rejoicing in the Lord. He, he addressed that first. Because that was the application of everything to look forward to. That was the thing that, that, that he said, you need to rejoice in the Lord. And you can weigh out these fleshful These people that are trying to get you to walk in the flesh, you can weigh that out by how you rejoice in the Lord. See, Paul says, if these people think that they have confidence in the flesh, I have more. See, Paul's reason for boasting in his flesh is to, to look forward to Christ. It's not to say, well, look, look, they think that they're awesome, but I'm even more awesome, and I just want to talk about me, 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 me. See, we always want to consider what our comparative motives are. See, because you can see here, Paul is about to compare his fleshful gain to other people's fleshful gain. But it's not for his own self-righteousness. And I mean, this is an example of this. Paul says, does the same exact thing elsewhere in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says in verse 22, well, verse 18 he sent, says, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. And then when we hear the word boasting in the flesh, it's almost like that's absolute arrogance. How are you going to talk about you, right? Well, Paul does, but not with the wrong motive. Many of us have the wrong motives. But if you look in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, he says, are they Hebrews? This is him boasting in his flesh. This is how Paul goes about boasting in his flesh. He says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonment, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journey from dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxieties for all the church. Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to fall? I am not indignant. And you think you've had a bad day. Now that's a bad day. And he says, I'll boast in my flesh. This is how Paul boasts in his flesh. It points to the glory of Christ. See, Paul's motives are not here to, to boast in his flesh, but to point to Christ. What do we do when we compare ourselves to one another? I mean, Paul says, I have more. See, we compare our, ourselves to one another to give us comfort of our own hearts. But we need to be careful doing that because our heart is deceptive above all else. We'll compare our sin with other people's sin and we act like it's no big deal. We don't want anybody to judge our sin, right? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as the guy over there. You know? But oh, my sin ain't that bad. We look at our sin as if it's just like maybe a little traffic ticket. But their sin, that's bad. See, we compare ourselves to one another with false motives. We... We don't want to do that. We, we're, we're in this, sin, this culture of downgrading what sin is. See, and you can tell what you're doing by how you're comparing your lives to one another instead of comparing them to Christ. Are you, as you're doing comparison to your daily activities. Because, I mean, basic, face it, we all do these things. We'll go through life and we'll say, well, I know I'm on the right path because I'm following so-and-so. I know I'm doing this right because so-and-so is doing it. But we don't seek to say, am I doing these things that's pleasing to the Lord? We do this not with only our sin nature, we do this with our activities. We will, we will base the amount of times that we'll go do certain things based on if, what everybody else is doing. And that's why we're in a culture the way we are. We, we, and, and I've been saying for quite some time that we're in a culture that has taught people, in, taught people what to think rather than how to think. We have said, well, look at me and you can follow this way. But when you're, the people that you're looking at are not striving to do the will of the Lord, you're making false comparatives. So when you strive to seek the supremacy of Christ, we do this by considering what, your comparative motives. What is motivating you to compare your life to your friends? What is motivating you to comparing what you're doing based on the, your family? Based on your loved ones? Based on your church members? What is your motive for doing that? Is it to help them come along? See, compare your motives with what would be pleasing to the Lord. Not what would be acceptable to your flesh. See, this wasn't Paul's intent. He wasn't intending to point to the flesh because that would destroy his testimony. His intent was to point directly to, point directly to Jesus Christ. Because he strove to see the supremacy of Christ. And we need to do the same thing as we're wrestling with ourselves and wondering how we can actually gain spiritual treasure. Trying to analyze in our own hearts and minds, is Christ my treasure or is he my means to treasure? You strive to see the supremacy of Christ by examining your testimony. See, a powerful testimony points to the folly of the flesh. Look with me at verses 5 and 6. Paul really gives his pedigree here. He says, they have confidence in the flesh. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. So what, what you see here, and let me remind you of the context one more time. 
Paul, it may seem like he's boasting his own testimony, because that's what he's doing. Remember, Paul used to be a Jew, used to be a, a, a Pharisee. He says so right here. The Pharisees coming into the church, or the, the Judaizers coming into the church. A Judaizer is some a, a convert who was Jewish, and they heard the gospel truth, and they say, "Oh, I believe that." But yet, if you're going to be a part of the covenant people of God, you have to be circumcised too. And Paul says, no, 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 no. And Paul has been wrestling with these Judaizers for about 20 years now. There was really no evidence that the Judaizers were at the Philippian church, the church in Philippi, or, or Paul would have elaborated on this more. I mean, if you want to hear about what it looks like to elaborate and to really scold the Judaizers, read the book of Galatians. He says, I hope that those people will emasculate themselves. They cut it right off. There is no circumcision. I mean, he was pretty vile about condemning them. He says, if anybody comes preaching a different gospel to you rather than the one that I preach, let them be accursed. Let them be damned. But you don't see that kind of language here. But Paul is still saying, let me give you a little bit of a comparison. These people who come to you and say you've got to do this and do that and do this and it's not based on the righteousness of Christ on a cross, they have nothing to boast in. Let me remind you of my testimony, Paul says. He says that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He probably used the word circumcision for the reason because that's what the main thing of the Judaizers were. Was to, 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 you have to be circumcised. Right? So he probably pointed that out right off the bat and said, look, I was circumcised on the eighth day. And then he says, not only was I circumcised on the eighth day, but I was of the people of Israel. See, Paul probably put this in here for an effect. Because he's saying, look, some of these Judaizers, they, they were converts. They were Ishmaelites. They weren't of the, the, peop, the, the children of the promise from, from Genesis. When Abraham was promised a, a seed, he went out and had a, 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 a child with H Hagar. No, they, uh, I am not from them. I am from the people of Israel. So he used this really for an effect to say, they think that you're great and you've got to boast in your flesh. Not me. Let, me. let me boast in my flesh because I have more. Not only was he of the people of Benjamin, or the people of Israel, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why is that important? So as you're trying to think about Paul's testimony, as it should stir you up to examine your own testimony, he says he's from the tribe of Benjamin. That's a pretty big deal. We hear Paul's name, but you've got to remember, when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, Paul or his original name, Saul, is the same name as the very first king of Israel. So he is really boasted in who he is. He's saying that I, not only am I the people of Israel, I can trace my heritage the whole way back to Abraham. Now, unlike these people, they would have boasted in the flesh. I can boast in my flesh. I know my lineage the whole way back to Abraham. And look... The people of Benjamin, we were a great people. We, we were the only people that came together with the tribe of Judah during the reign of King David. We were great people. Now, sure, we've had some bad times in our lives and done some bad things, but overall, you can boast in the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul say, they want to boast? Let me boast in who I am. Not only that being the case, but he also says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. This means that the, he is of the, 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 his parents did not become accustomed to the Hellenistic worldview. He, he spoke Aramaic. His mom was a Hebrew. His dad was a Hebrew. He is a pure Hebrew people. What Paul is really saying here is you can see two categories. He is saying, I am ethnically better than them. I am ethnically better than them. My race is above their race. Because I am of the people of God. You think you can boast in your flesh? That's, that's category one. And then he has another category. So you see his ethnical rights. Today, day, day and age, people would say he has Jewish privilege. Not just white privilege. His Jewish privilege. And Paul says, yep, I'll boast in my flesh. 
And then he has list two. Now, it's not only his ethnical rights, but it's his earned rights. He says that, that as to the law, he's a Pharisee. So Paul was not only just a Pharisee, he was the top dog Pharisee. You read in Galatians 1 where he says, I far excelled everybody else. I far exceeded everybody else. So Paul wasn't just a, a slacker. He was the man. He was the top dog. He says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Paul probably seen himself as, uh, as a modern day Phineas from Numbers who when Israelite went out and hoard out their religious belief to an another God, God started to put plagues upon them because of the very fact that they were going after other gods. And Phineas, see, what did he do? He went in, he, he, he slaughtered as God did to stop the plagues. So Paul, if you think about the persecuting of the church, Paul was probably seeing himself as a modern day Phineas. And he was stopping the false worshipers and all of a sudden God knocked them off his high horse and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Paul was boasting in his earned right as well. He says, I was a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Now this isn't Paul saying that, that he was without sin. This isn't Paul saying that I didn't do any sin. But what he's saying is within the righteousness of the law, I fulfilled everything that God commanded us to do. When I sinned, I would give a sin offering. When I would act a certain way, I'd give that proper offering. And he used that as a right standing between God. He knew that he would be right in between him and God because he was blameless. Do you see what Paul's doing here? He's saying if they think they can boast in their flesh, I have more. But that's not where the power comes in. The power comes in when he says in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, whether it was my racial gain, whether it was my religious zeal, whether it was my record of persecution, or whether it was my own righteousness, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. It's loss. It's, it's no good. See, when you examine your own testimony, it should powerfully point to the folly of the flesh. What gain can you really have in ra your, your race? What gain can you have in your religious zeal? Does it really put you in right standing with God? Mm -mm. But in today's day and age, people want to focus on being racially proper, and we've got to go and, you know, you're, you're, you're white, so you're, you're in the wrong because you're white. Or if you're black, you, you know, we, we, we've got to be exalted. See, one of the, one of the problems within, the, within our culture right now is we want to point out that there's a, really a divide between race and lifestyle. There is no divide in, in the household of God. To even bring these up, and it's a common topic that everybody wants to talk about today. Well, how are you in racial segregation? How are you on, on racial equality? Oh, yeah, it's all the same. Oh, that's racist to even say that. No, you are all dead in your trespasses and sins. Each and every one of you deserve death. But God, in His grace and mercy, He's redeemed you. He has called you out of the pits, and He has called you unto Himself. There is no difference, there is no category between white, black, brown, zero. You're all either in Christ or you're out of Christ. One or the other, there is no category. And that's what Paul is saying here. You want to boast in your flesh? I can boast in my race, I can boast in, my, in, in, in everything that I do, my, my accomplishments, and far better than you. I stand blameless. See, your testimony can be corrupted. Your testimony, when you're focusing on the wrong thing, you, everything that's going on with, with, with the riots, to even focus on that. Many of you have asked me, why do, how come we don't have topics on these and sermons on that? Because it's racist to do it. I truly feel that if you want to get the gospel out and you want to love God and you want to boast in Christ, you boast in Christ. Not in your flesh. 
You don't show racial categories. There is none. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your social status. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Now I could boast in all this, he said. I had the race and I had the social status, but I counted all as loss. See, that is what the gospel does. The gospel counts everything as loss. But we get ourselves burdened down in this idea that we've got to make this right and make this right and make this right. No, 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 no. You go straight to the gospel. What's going on with your testimony? Do you, do, do you think about these things? Do you think about what it is that the Lord has changed in you? Without focusing on the, 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 the things that the culture wants to draw out. Oh, brothers and sisters, the culture wants to take your focus off of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, to the point that some of us, we, we think our own testimony because we've been raised in the church is as it's a, it's a bad thing because you've had the privilege of being raised in a, in a Christian home. Or maybe be, that you did walk in the, the wrong side of the tracks and the Lord grabbed you and straightened you out and drew you in, but yet you, you're more focused on the culture situations than the testimony that the Lord has done in your heart and in your life. See, if you really want to know if, if the Lord is your treasure and not a means to your treasure, I'm telling you to look inward. Now I know sometimes uh, uh, you'll hear me say, it's not about you, it's not about you, quit looking at yourself, look to Jesus. But when you look inward at the testimony that the Lord has done with you, you're looking to Jesus, unless you're considering your motives are in, in, in ill per perspective, unless your motives are incorrect. But, but when you examine your own testimony, and it points to the, points to the folly of your flesh, you'll start to recognize if you are really striving to see the supremacy of Christ or if you're striving to see the supremacy of the culture. See, consider the weight of your testimony. How has the Lord changed you? What has the Lord done in your life? Because rather you've had a Damascus Road change or rather you have been raised your whole life in the church. You have a powerful testimony. But many of us don't focus on the tes our testimony. And as a result of that, many of us are unsure about sharing our faith. Many of us can't even explain the gospel you know you have a feeling that God has changed you and has, has drawn you to Him and you really do have a desire to see Christ? Your testimony is powerful. Just like Paul's is. As long as it's pointing to Jesus. But let me make something very clear. Your testimony is not the gospel. I've asked several of you what the gospel is. Get in the habit of asking people what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. You'll start hearing all kinds of things that aren't the gospel. They're a result of the gospel, but they're not the gospel. You'll start hearing things like, well, you, you, you know, I love Jesus. That's true, but that's not the gospel. Well, it means that I, I read my Bible and I really enjoy it. Right. It means that I try to be a good person. That's definitely not the gospel. That's all works righteousness. See, your testimony can point to the gospel, but it's not the gospel. Your testimony is not an end to itself, but it could be used as a means to the end. Your testimony could be used, as Paul's has been, for a way to wake somebody up saying, wow, man, the Lord's really going to use them. And even if it's somebody that doesn't believe, they might say, wow, you know, you've had this sudden change. That's interesting. See, when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ, you can examine your testimony. Not only so, but the, the more you examine your testimony, the more you look to the supremacy of the gospel. So when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ, you do this by striving to see the surpassing value of Christ in an intimate relationship. 
Look at verse 8 with me. Paul said, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. See, this is really a recapitulation of what Paul said in chapter 1 when he, he, he said um, in verse, chapter 1, verse 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, which I can't tell, which I can't choose. It's my desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more for your, for your progress and your joy in the faith. This is really what Paul was saying. Everything in my past is, I I consider, is loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus through an intimate relationship. See, you really see the whole desire here for Paul, the reason for the whole desire here. He says in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth or the, compa- the, the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. See, brothers and sisters, this is where this little word has a profound effect. What does it mean to know Christ Jesus? Most people in America know who Christ Jesus is. I mean, heck, we got cuss words named after them. There's a big difference between knowing Christ Jesus and knowing about Christ Jesus. Many in evangelical churches today think they know Christ Jesus, but they only know about him. And a lot of that is because of the preachers of the pulpits in these churches today. They'll preach about Jesus, but they don't preach the gospel. They'll preach about the gospel, but they don't preach the gospel. They won't reveal your sin to you, and most of you don't like to hear about your sin. Who does? That's gloomy and down. Oh, but once you're... Why do you think the psalmist said, David said, Search me, O Lord, and reveal my sin. Oh, because there's no greater joy to know that you're, you're turning from, from your sin nature and being more and more like Christ. But we don't want to hear that. We want to hear feel-good messages. See, to know Jesus is to have a personal, intimate relationship with Him. There's a big difference between knowing somebody and knowing about somebody. I mean, James, Jesus' brother, says that you believe God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So how can we know if Jesus is our treasure or our means to our treasure? Is by the very fact that are you striving to see the, surp- the surpassing value of Christ in an intimate relationship. Think about this. We were just talking about testimonies. Some of you in here I know have amazing testimonies because I've heard them. But just think about it. You give your testimony and you're talking about how you were walking in a certain way. You went through certain situations in your lives and then all of a sudden, boom, the Lord changed you, turned you the other direction. You were walking one way and because of the, the grace and the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ, he turned you the other direction and you're now walking in newness of life and you, you spill your whole testimony out. You tell about everything that you used to be and you used to walk this way. Tell about your kids and your life history and all this and it's just, you just pour your heart and so out one day. And there you say, let's just say you have a little, your little girl sitting beside you. You're sitting in a restaurant and somebody comes up to you and goes, hey, how you doing? That's so good to see you. Boy, you're doing good. Your little girl's getting big. That's awesome. Hey, how, how's your dog doing? You know, I mean, I, 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 I've really been thinking about your dog and just wondering. And you're thinking in your head, who is this person? And they start saying, well, hey, do you, you, you mind if I sit down with you and, and have lunch with you? And, hey, how's your husband doing? Or how's your wife doing? And you're like, do I know you? And you're like, well, or they're like, no, I, I don't know you, but I know all about you because I heard your testimony. And they're asking you all these intimate questions. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be kind of creepy? Like, get away from me. 
Like, you think you know me, but you don't. Get away from me. Does that sound familiar? Jesus said, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we did many wonderful things in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. And he said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You think you knew him, but you knew all about him. See, that's the difference. We see, and we've got to recognize that there's a huge difference between knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus. To know Jesus is to sit down with him, have a personal relationship with him, striving to, to be with him, longing to love him. Everything that you say, everything that you do is to be in his presence. You're striving to see the supremacy of Christ. And if that's you, you're seeing the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. It's recognizing that you were an enemy of the cross. It's recognizing that you hated God. That, that you were spitting in His face. You wanted nothing to do with Him. And Oh, don't hear that wrong because some of you have been raised in a church and say, I've never felt that way. But if you don't have the love for Christ, you have spit in his face because you've had the wrong motives. You haven't had a relationship with him. We need to reflect on that. Do you have this desire? Do you have this intimate Desire for Jesus to where it is fueling everything that you do. It's fueling your, your life decisions. Are you counting him as, as gain and everything else is loss? See, strive to see the supremacy of Christ by striving to see the surpassing value through an intimate relationship with Christ. Uh, drive yourself to him. Recognize that he has saved you. That he took upon the wrath of God for you. That before he said, let there be light, if you are a blood-bought believer, he chose you. He set his heart on you and died on the tree for you. Outside of that, you deserve condemnation. He didn't choose you for something good in you. He chose you because he loved you even when you hated him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So don't just sit there and say, well, I've never hated Jesus. No, you have. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wage of sin is death, the Bible tells us. You are an enemy of the cross. And even though you are an enemy, he came down paid the penalty for your sin and raised for your justification. As a result of, of his work, the Father has declared you as righteous. If you have repented of your sin, if you are his child, and if that happens, you will have a heart's desire for him, a longing for a relationship with him. It says in Ezekiel that he rips out your heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh, a heart after his own heart. See, this striving to have an intimate relationship with Jesus is not the kind of thing, it's living a life thinking, Jesus is my boyfriend type of thing, and he takes me out for dinner, and he has nothing really, no, no desire, doesn't require anything of me, and you know, I just keep on doing the same thing that I'm doing, and that's okay because Jesus loves me. He is love, right? See, you strive to see the supremacy of Christ by recognizing the spiritual trash in your life. And when you recognize this, you, you, you'll have a spiritual gain. Look again at verse 7 and 8 with me. He says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This is how you can tell if Christ is your treasure or if he's your means of your treasure. Are you seeking to gain Christ with everything that you say, everything that you do? Even through your fleshful gain? 
Look, Paul says, everything that I could boast in, I consider it as loss. But it's just not everything, my, my, my race, my, my ethnical and social, sta- or the, my social standing, it's everything. He, he really elaborates in verse 8 when he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. So Paul is actually painting a picture. What he's doing is he's painting this picture. You guys remember them old um, tipping uh, vintage uh, uh, judgment scales? That you, they would have them hangy things down. I call them hangy things. I don't even know hangy is a word. But you, they, they had the thing, they had them chains hanging down. You had two plates there, and you put a little bit of chains in one side, and it would come down like this, and then come this way. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys have all seen them vintage things? That's the picture that Paul's painting here. He's saying, I put all of my worldly stuff over here. I put my ethnicity, my, my, my social gain. I put everything, my work, my job, my money, everything. My family, my wife, my son, my daughter, my grandparents, all of the riches in my life, all of my future riches, all my past riches, put them here, and I put Christ over here. And he just outweighs it. He just flips the scales. There's no comparison. None at all. Christ is his worth. Christ is his gain. He, he, he's not looking for anything else but Christ. Is that you? Are you striving to recognize what your spiritual trash is by looking to the gain of Christ? Because everything else in this world is garbage to Christ compared to Christ. Now this ain't saying that our wives and our daughters and our children, our husbands, our jobs are not important. But it's saying that he counts them as rubbish. See, if you look at this word, rubbish, this word is really a vulgar term. It means just that, garbage, rubbish, feces. It's almost a word play between the dog that Paul was talking about earlier when he said, when, when the Judaizers came, he said, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This, this, this word scubula, it, it's what, it, it means rubbish or filth. That's something you would feed to the dogs. And my wife's looking at me because she knows what the full meaning of it is. It's poop. He, he's saying everything is poop. It's like a polished turd. That's what everything it is. It's scuba. And it, it might sound like scuba, like you're going to go scuba diving, but you definitely don't want to go scuba diving in scuba because it's nothing but poop. He says, count it all as poop compared to Christ. This is everything. So you, you, you can see if you're striving for the supremacy of Christ by recognizing your spiritual trash. There are things in your life that you're counting more important than Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jesus warns about this big time. In in, in Matthew, chapter 10, verse 34 and 38. And we we all grasp on to to when when Jesus said, we'll say things like, we know that not so much as a hair can fall from our head outside of our Father in heaven. And we, we all agree with that. And yes, we know that Jesus has us. He, he loves us. God has us. And we're comforted. But how can you know if you're actually in that comfort? Look at what verse Matthew 10, 34 through 38 says. He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. What? That sounds different than what we're used to hearing. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to be, bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring pe- not peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. It's not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospel will find it. You think that because you have a fuzzy Jesus is my boyfriend type of thing and you can't count everything else as crap? That you're in his, in his comfort? Mm -mm. It's all got to be trash. That's not saying that you don't care for it and love it, but where is your value at? See, when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ, you do this by recognizing what is your spiritual trash. And when you do this, you'll, you'll, you'll gain spiritual gain. I remember the, the old hymn, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Consider what is the most valuable thing to you? What is the most supreme value? Do you value your family more than Christ? Do you value money more than Christ? Do you count your money rather than trying to give a big testimony? Do you count your money instead of giving a tip and say, oh, no, that's mine? What is it that's driving you? See, Family life in itself isn't bad. But what do you value? Some of you need to count all of your past baggage as loss. Some of you have past baggage from past history that you bring into your present reality and you're holding on to it and you're clinging on to it like it has value and you're not meaning to, but it is. Oh, cling to the cross of Christ. And unless you count it as loss you will not experience spiritual gain see when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ as your spiritual treasure you'll tear down all the physical barriers that produce the spiritual trash in you See, next time you're walking around or you're in conversation with people or next time that you end up running into people that you may or may not know reflect on the very fact that what is my testimony doing for them? Listen to them and hear from them. Strive to be, see the supremacy of Christ. See, when you strive to see the supremacy of Christ, you'll tear down the physical strongholds. The, the physical strongholds. So strive, brothers and sisters, to see the supremacy of Christ and tear down those physical strongholds. Let us pray. Grace is